word of prayer. Father, we thank you. I want to stop and, and thank you for how good you've been. Uh, I've actually gotten to speak about that already today, and I'm thankful for that chance to talk about your faithfulness, your goodness, um, the way that you have been there for me, and God, the way that you've provided for my family in the absolute chaos of the last month. You have been a consistent presence of righteousness and holiness and strength. And I thank you for it. I'm thankful for how this church can see that, that we've been able to experience that together. And in many other stories, in most of our lives, we've seen that and experienced that in different ways. And that allows us to then proclaim it to a world who doesn't know it. To proclaim it to a world who desperately needs it. To, to know that there is a creator that loves them, that cares for them, and has their best interest at heart. My God, that changes everything. I'm thankful that we know it. God, I'm thankful for the way that you are moving in the life of this church. We ask your blessings on our future and the work that you want to do here, that your kingdom would grow here. God, we want to thank you for these two graduates who are part of our family. Uh, we are overjoyed with them being here, being a part, being able to celebrate their accomplishments, to send them into the world, uh, God, with you to watch over them and care for them. And God, we are excited about their future we're excited about our future. We're excited about our ability to continue to love them and care for them. And Father, I'm excited about this passage that we're going to study in a few minutes. There's so much truth here. There's so many pieces to be seen as this story unfolds in front of us. And I ask that you would let this old story come to life for us as we think about a healing that you performed through Peter and then the unbelievable message and the boldness that he and your followers had in response to it. God, there's inspiration here for us that we need. And I ask that you would provide it, God, that you would speak to us from this old text. Would you continue to receive our worship? We want to sing and bring praise to you. God, let you be honored and glorified. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. I love that song. I love the message with it, especially there in the end. Oh, come, oh, come, immortal Savior, and claim thy royal throne. What a fascinating thing to be able to sing in the form of prayer. I want you to get your Bibles and open to uh, the book of Acts. We've been working through, for those of you that have not been here with us the last several weeks, we've been working through the book of Acts now for a month or so, and that follows on several months coming out of the Gospel of Luke, written by the same author, and that's one of the reasons we're doing that. Um, and one of the great things it does for us as a church is in the book of Acts, we see the, the growth and the, the foundation and the development of what we understand as the New Testament church. Uh, it provides some guidelines for us of who we are wanting to be, uh, some direction for what it means to be uh, the Lord's people here uh, on earth. I want to tell you before we jump into it, while you're getting to Acts chapter 3, I have struggled with this one. Uh, and, and, and the reason being is how to present it, because the key passage in this, in Acts chapter 3, you see the heading over verse 1, Peter heals a lame beggar. It's this healing event that happens in this story, and everything else is in response to that. Well, I preached this story here in November of last year. And I'm just like, I don't want to just come and preach the same sermon, right? Because one of you will remember it, and then it'll be awkward for everybody, right? I know almost none of the rest of you would, but one of you would have been like, oh, yeah, you did that. So what do you do? We can't skip the story. It's too significant. It's too important. And the unfolding of the, the acts of the apostles, and obviously for us to understand our history and who it is that's calling us to be, we can't just skip it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the, the, the 40,000 mile approach to it. And we're going to kind of glide over it and hit the high points as we go. And in doing that, cover chapters 3 and chapter 4, which may be way more than we want to do at one time, but we're going to grit in and do it. All right. Um, so we start, and we're going to be reading the passage as we go. We start in Acts chapter 3 and verse 1, the healing that God does through Peter. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and it was three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. This is on the east side of the temple, just so you can kind of get your bearing. He saw Peter and John about to enter, and he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. I love how that, like John's there. He's not doing anything, but he's present. And Peter said, look at us. 
So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver, gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Can you imagine the boldness of saying that statement? If I just look up, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't lie if I told you I didn't try it. I woke up to my mom while she was sick. In the name of Jesus, get up. The boldness of that, to even begin to imagine that the name of Jesus has that kind of power. But look at what happens. And taking him by his right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. And he jumped to his feet and he began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gates called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. For those of you that are keeping notes, you'll remember that we talked about this in, I think I said November, it was February of 2020. We came and we did this conference back here, the stuff's still hanging on the wall and Truth is, I see that now as God's beginning hand of direction to eventually bring my family here and see if we can't maybe enact some of the things we talked about there. But one of the things we saw from this passage, I'm just going to remind you as we move forward, that this was about being missional. It was about Peter and John living their life in such a way where the following of Jesus and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus was so paramount that that's what dictated all of their behavior. So they come to this beggar man, the kind of guy that you usually just be like, you know, please don't look at me. You know, and you just walk on by. He's there every day. It's not like they've not seen this man before. Truth is, Peter, being the talkative type, probably knew him by name. Because you know at some point Peter stopped and spoke, right? Stuck his foot in his mouth, made it awkward. They've seen this guy before every day when they come to church. But this time, the Holy Spirit has come. Something is different in the life of Peter and of John as they see this man. And we talked about how they, they give him attention. They noticed him. They actually acknowledged, like, here's a human being in need. And they paid attention. And they gave him what they had. Peter says, look, I don't, I don't have any money. And I'm sure that man was distraught when he heard that because that's what he wanted. Peter said, but I have something and what I have I will give to you. And he offers him in the name of Jesus healing power. And there's something significant that follows that that's worth even looking back at it. In verse 6, he says that, in the name of Jesus, walk. And then in verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Peter offers him a hand. And the power that is present in that, not only in the boldness and the belief to think that the name of Jesus would possibly have the power to bring healing to a man who can't walk, Peter in the audacity, or what we would call faith, reaches and takes him by the hand and tests it. I believe that Jesus has healed you. The name of Jesus has brought healing to your legs. Give me your hand and I'm going to pick you up off the ground. If Jesus has not healed here, that gets really awkward. We see the faith in Peter. Missional living. Putting himself out there. He's risked really everything in this moment, I think. For him and for this poor guy. Because if it doesn't work, it's just awkward, embarrassing, and hard for everybody. But the Lord is faithful. And the Lord brings healing here. This power has come. Peter has both the power of the Holy Spirit to help bring this healing. And also has the, the willingness to embrace and to help people. It starts there. And we breeze over that quickly because we've gotten to talk about that before. And if you want, we'll go back and find it and give you something to, to listen to and read on another day. But he brings this healing. And then he turns and speaks to the crowd. Because obviously people are fascinated by that. They've ignored this man for years. They're not paying any attention to him. And now all of a sudden he's up and he's walking about. Something significant has happened. So it says in verse 11 that while it, the man held on to Peter and John, which is actually a beautiful image that Peter and John have moved on. They're no longer at the gate. They've moved into the Solomon Colonnades, which is, seems to be where the church would gather. The, the Christians would gather there until they got kicked out of the temple the years later. They, and this man's like holding on to him, like grabbing by the arm, has his legs wrapped around. He won't let go. So he held on to them, and all the people were astonished and came running to this place uh, called Solomon's Colonnade. And when Peter saw this, <laughs> the preacher in him starts to come alive. He says, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? And I'm fascinated by that question. Peter, 
looks to a group of people who are in the temple of God, worshiping the creator of the universe, something that they have known and proclaimed their entire life, his ability to create and to bring new life and redemption to those who were hurting. And they're surprised that it's actually happened. And Peter's question cuts to the heart, doesn't it? Why are we surprised when God does exactly what he has said he will do? Why do we get surprised when the worst sinner gets saved? We shouldn't be. We should be in awe that God has done it. Peter says, look, we, you're churchy people. You believe this. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. So why are you surprised that God has brought healing? Why do you stare at us? This is the end of verse uh, 12. As if it's by our own power, God in us, we had made this man walk. And then he shifts attention. This isn't about me, he says in verse 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. And you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and the righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. This is awkward preaching, right? He's, he's getting all the weird stuff out of the way. You killed the author of life. What a fantastic phrase. I got stuck on that a couple days ago. Like I was reading through this and thinking, and I got stuck on that. You killed the author of life. Wow. But God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. Now, that's going to make sense in a minute, because there's another question that's coming later. I'm just going ahead and telling you about it, that Peter and John get arrested because they were preaching the resurrection of the dead. And I literally wrote out in my notes, like, where did they do that? They really didn't, except when you go back to what he just said right there. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses. I had assumed they were preaching resurrection of the dead for you and me. As in something that may be coming. No. They were preaching resurrection of the dead as in something that has already happened. That Christ has been raised for the dead. Which opens the door for the possibility of us being raised for the dead. But that's what gets them arrested. The audacity to proclaim that God has done what all of the prophets said he would do. Matter of fact, he's going to talk about that in a minute. Verse 16. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that had a completed healing, that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Do you notice the cute little equation that's there? What brings the healing? It's the name of Jesus. The power of Jesus combined with the faith of those who believe in him. Can Jesus bring healing all by himself? Yeah, absolutely. He does what he wants. He's God. But does God move among people who aren't faithful? No, he doesn't. So notice the way that, that, that Peter says this. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has brought healing to this man. How fascinating an explanation of what has happened. So we see this story, this, this thing has happened, it's created a stir. Peter turns to the groups that are around him and like, hey, let me explain to you what has happened. Well, apparently the crowd kept getting bigger because in verse 17, he transitions to like full on sermon, right? Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Now we got to play with this for a while because there's a cool thing that happens here in verse 19 and 20. So he calls them to repentance, turn to the Lord, so that sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. I don't know about you, but that sounds amazing to me at the moment. The idea that a time of refreshing from come from the Lord, I feel taste buds of that. I know more is coming. But listen to what he says in verse 20. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. At first, I get confused by that. Isn't the Messiah already come? Right? Peter believes that Jesus is the Messiah. The Messiah has already come. So Peter's not talking about the coming of the Messiah. He's assuming that that's already happened and everybody knows it. He's talking about the return. 
the coming again of the Messiah who will come and who will bring to conclusion the day of judgment, the day of timing, and bring about God's will in enacting his kingdom on earth. So it's this future sense. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. But there's something cool that happens here in the Greek that our English kind of butchers. And let me lay that out for you. In verse 20, if you were to lay this out in, in the order in which it's written in Greek, it says that he may send to you what has been appointed, Messiah, Jesus. And it's interesting, and to me, the reason that makes it is significant to me and worth pointing out is that he's emphasizing the name of Jesus as the Messiah and the way that he lays it out is that, that God is going to send this thing that he's apportioned out for you, the Messiah, Jesus. So it's emphasizing not only that the Messiah is coming, but that Messiah has a name. And we know who he is. And his name is Jesus. What's even cooler is you break down into the Greek that the word Messiah there is actually Christos. It's the, we would usually use it as Lord. So the sentence ends in Christos Jesus. Christ. Jesus. Pretty good preaching if you ask me. Let's keep going. Verse 21, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised. For Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you and anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. And he's going to keep going and reminding them, look, the prophets have been saying this. Every prophet that's ever read, you've ever talked about, has talked about the coming of the Messiah and the things that he's going to do. And we're telling you that Jesus is that guy. Now this preaching gets him in trouble, like any good preaching would. Because in chapter 4, Peter and John get called before the Sanhedrin. This is like, you know, the church court people because of what they were saying. Look at what it says in verse 1. Priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, what is it? The resurrection of the dead. I told you that question was coming. They seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now, why'd they get arrested? For speaking, for talking out loud. You're right. To the Jewish people, this is blast, especially to some of the Sadducees who didn't think resurrection was possible at all. There's accusations of blasphemy here. And here's what I want you to think. Like, and, and we, we need to identify this for what it is. This is the first recorded act of actual persecution against a Christian. Peter and John are speaking truth, are accused of blasphemy, and are arrested just for talking. They've not done anything else. And we would call this actual persecution. Right? They were arrested because they were teaching and proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. This is what persecution would look like. Now you and I have never experienced persecution. I know that tends to be a hot word that we throw around in churches and some people think, oh, we're being, per no, we're not. I've never been arrested for speaking, all right? Never been arrested at all, by the way, just throwing that out there. <laughs> Today seems like a really important day to say that out loud. Yeah, but I'm, I mean, have you ever been arrested for speaking about Jesus? Have you ever lost your job or your home for speaking about Jesus? Truth is, have you ever even spoken about Jesus? Much less experienced persecution for doing it. We don't know what this is like. We like to think we do, but we don't. In the free world that you and I live in, persecution is not an experience that we have ever had. It may come one day. In y'all's lifetime, it may. I hope not, but it may. But what we're going to see as this story unfolds, this is why I want to see the whole story today, is look at what happens to the church when this persecution comes upon them. So Peter and John are, are arrested. They're persecuted. They're going to be arrested and flogged. Bad things are going to happen because they had the audacity to preach about resurrection. And in verse uh, 5, it says, The next day the rulers, elders, teacher law, they met in Jerusalem. And as the high priest was there, so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. So everybody's there. They had Peter and John brought before them, began to question them by what power or what name did you do this? And Peter says, boy, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Filled with the Holy Spirit, he says in verse 8. Rulers and elders of the people, you talking about speaking truth to power. If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was held, healed, then know this, 
you and all the people. I love how he labels that out. Like, we did something nice to a guy, and you arrested us for it. But okay, if that's what's happening here, let me tell you how it happened. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, by the way, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. He's looking at them, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found and no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. If you ever get confused, which it's okay if you do, because I do, and I've been doing this, you know, long time with schooling and all that. If you ever get confused, like you need to simplify, what is the gospel in one phrase? There it is. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name by which we can be saved except for Jesus. If you're ever confused about what to say to somebody, if you ever get into a situation and you don't know how to help them and you forget all the things that you learned in Sunday school about how to, just, it's Jesus. Jesus will fix it. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can save you. It's all about Jesus and let the Holy Spirit work it out from there. Because that's what Peter does here. Notice it said he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he just points to the name of Jesus and God's about to do some really cool stuff, right? The Holy Spirit takes over and things start to play out. He's filled with this Holy Spirit. He speaks and then the Sanhedrin responds in verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and they realized that they were unschooled ordinary men. I love that. Like, remember, we've talked about this already. Like, Peter's not a preacher. I'm kind of joking at times. He's becoming one, but he's not. He keeps showing us how to present the gospel, and he has no training to do it at all. It's just a willingness and a courage to do it, and the Holy Spirit inspires him and does everything else. And even the Sanhedrin, who don't really believe in this whole Holy Spirit thing, have to recognize, here's just a normal fisherman guy. What is he doing? And they're astonished by it. It says in verse 13, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Let me ask you a difficult question. At any point in your life, could your friends take note that you have been with Jesus? Is your prayer life, is your devotion life, is your time of worship on Sundays or dinner, whatever it is that you do, be connected to Jesus in a hundred different ways. But is there ever a time in your life where your friends can take note? <laughs> David's been with Jesus today. I hope so. If not, there's a challenge and a swift kick in the rear coming right there. To live in such a way, to be such devotion with Jesus, that our friends can look at us and take note, oh yeah, that's a Jesus guy. She's totally a Jesus freak. They've been with Jesus today. So they took note that these men had been with Jesus, but since they could see the man, this is verse 14, who had been healed, standing there with them, <laughs> there's nothing they could say, right? They have their own way of looking at the world. They have their whole politics thing that are being destroyed by a crude presentation of truth. So they ordered them to withdraw, and they conferred together. What, what are we going to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they performed a notable sign. They wouldn't even call it a miracle, and we can't deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Now, that sounds funny to us. Like, it's funny to me to think that these old men in robes are going to tell Peter, hey, don't talk about this anymore. Except you've got to remember, this is the equivalent of the Supreme Court. All right? Put that in context. So Peter and John go to the Supreme Court. They have the little court session. And then all those Supreme Courts come out and say, thus saith the government, don't talk about this anymore. You're not allowed to speak about it. That gives it a little more gravity. Helps us understand the depth of what's about to happen. Verse 18, they called him in again, commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, well, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? Well, you be the judges, ask for us. We cannot help speaking about what we have seen or heard. How fascinating is that? I can't help it. I've experienced that lately. I don't know if y'all heard, like, uh, uh, my family's put a contract on a house. We're hoping to be moving here, uh, like, just within the week or so. I can't stop talking about it. I've told all my family. Matter of fact, I learned that my sister uh, and her kids were in town yesterday hanging out with my dad. They snuck out and snuck into the backyard and looked through the house. It's not mine yet, by the way. It totally belongs to somebody else. But they got out there and went looking around. I'm excited about it. 
I'm going to have a house. First time ever. How big a deal is that? I, I want to talk about it because I have this tiny little nugget of good news that's in my life, and I want to talk about it all the time. How is it that we are not consistently always talking about the grand scale good news that Christ has saved me from my own demise? I'm a total mess up. I ruin everything I've ever done. I sin every single day, and I deserve the absolute depths of hell that have, have to be offered to me. But Jesus... Jesus saves me from that. This good news. We can't help but talk about good things that happen in our life. And I want you to try to frame what Jesus has done for us as that kind of good news. It is the thing that we talk about. And it's the thing that we need to be thinking about and registering with and, and salivating on all of it. That God has saved us through Jesus. That salvation has come through Jesus. And when we recognize that for the good news that it is, when we're dwelling on it all the time, it will come out of our mouth. We're going to talk about it. And when we talk about it, the Holy Spirit does what He does, and others get saved. Mission fulfilled. Peter and John basically said, we, we've seen everything. We've experienced the thing that has ever happened in all of history. We can't help but talking about it. So the Sanhedrin looks at them in verse 21. After further threats, they let them go. They couldn't decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened, which is really awkward for these church people. People are praising the God that they worship, but they don't like the reason that they're doing it. So they just kind of felt like, oh, we don't know what to do. Let's send them on their way. Because this man had been healed and he was over 40 years old. Now we get to the, the grand finale. Verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, as in they went back to church, right? Reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. So the they here is not Peter and John. It's the church, which is up to maybe 5,000 people is what it said a minute ago. I don't know if they're all there at the same time, but a whole bunch of churchy people, Jesus people, get together. They raise their voice in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they asked, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Do you hear the implications of what they're saying about the Sanhedrin, the churchy people? Like they're the ones rising up against the Lord. Indeed, verse 27, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city. City to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. We see that constant battle we've seen through Acts and Luke before of the sovereignty of God and the free will of man coinciding at the same time. It was totally Herod's fault. It was totally Pilate's fault. It's totally the Sanhedrin's fault, and yet it happened exactly the way God planned it. Both are true at the same time. Verse 29, Now, Lord, this is so good, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant. Jesus. They have just experienced the first ever form of Christian persecution. Peter and John have been arrested for doing nothing but talk, and it could have been terrible. They escaped by the skin of their teeth, basically because God empowered them to be smarter than the Supreme Court, and they kind of made them dumbstruck. They didn't know what to do. They come back to the church, and the church's response is what? Let's do this again. That's their prayer. Their prayer, after all the, the salutations, the stars, it boils down to verse to verse the end of verse 29. Consider their threats. Consider what just happened. Consider what they're saying they will do to us if we keep speaking. And empower us, enable us to speak your word with boldness. And on top of that, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Would you continue to heal people like you just did so that people would notice? I am blown away by this. In our churchy world, we have people talking about persecution. It's not really persecution. And our initial prayer is what? God protect us. Please don't let us. Please don't let our government take away our rights and our fruit. Please, please. And all those are fine. They're not bad things to ask for the Lord. But it is the wrong direction. 
this group of believers, the beginning of what we understand as the New Testament church, our forefathers who show us what it means to live a faithful life, experienced real, honest to God, threat to their life persecution, and their response is more please. Empower us not to be protected, but empower us to continue to speak and do the signs and the wonders that draw attention to us so that we can point attention to you. Do you hear the boldness in that? Can you see the faith that undergirds it? This holding on to a faith in Christ and a hope of an eternal life. These promises that come from God that they are betting their entire existence on. And it seems that God liked it. In verse 30, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I've been in some good prayer meetings, but that's never happened. <laughs> I hope it will. Maybe we'll work on that, right? Like we... Maybe that's what happens if we pray the prayer of 29 and 30. God responds and be like, yeah, now you're getting it. Now you understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But God responds. He's pleased. He likes what, what they've done. And they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the words of God boldly. I'm fascinated by this story. Peter and John just doing normal things. I mean, you think about, you read the first four, five, six verses of chapter three. What they do with this beggar guy is not all that significant. It's really not a big deal. It's a quaint little story. It makes for a cute little inspiring sermon. It's awesome. Hey, there's a sick guy. I can help the sick guy, not because I have money, but because I know Jesus. Here's Jesus. Get up and walk. Awesome. Cool. Move on. It's time to go to lunch. But when you frame that very simple, what seems like a normal act of missional living by two men who believed in Jesus and followed him, and then you see how it plays out. The rest of the world looks at it. They're in awe. Some people believe and they're fascinated by it. Yay, that's what we want. The powers that be get mad about it and they threaten them. Peter and John are like, what? You can't threaten me because Jesus holds my life and you have no authority over that. You can't stop me from speaking. So they keep speaking. They come back to the church. The church is like, you know what? I'm with you. That's the kind of preaching I want to listen to. And this is the kind of people I want to follow. Peter and John, we're with you. Not only are we with you, but we're actually going to have the crazy idea to pray. Pray, God, would you let this happen more? Give us opportunities and boldness to share about the salvation that Jesus comes and gives to us. And use signs and wonders to draw attention to it. We don't care about their threats. And God loved it. And God blessed it. The church obviously grew. And then they, they, they lived life together, 32 to you basically finish the chapter. It tells about this church who lived in fellowship with one another. What I would call the result of faithfulness and persecution is a genuine church family who's living life, sharing life, selling possessions to care for one another. Everything that you and I want for us. Everything we want for our families, for our church family. We see it right here and it comes as a result of bold and faithful living even in the face of persecution. I want you to take note of what happens in this story. Of the, <laughs> the outright crazy audacity, truth is, of Peter and John. And the boldness of the church around them in the face of real persecution. And we know it's real because we know what comes later, right? We know that the Sanhedrin, we know that the Romans follow through on the threats they give him. And we also see that the church never wavers from that. They don't back down. We'll see those stories unfold over the next full couple weeks. But take note of the bold faith of these believers in the face of, of persecution. And take note of what the Holy Spirit does. What the Holy Spirit can and will do through willing and faithful and courageous people. It brings healing to a beggar who needed it. It brings attention to Peter and John who wanted it. It brings opportunity to proclaim the gospel that absolutely has to happen. And it empowers and changes the dynamic of the church around them to live in such a way that the world takes notice. This is what the Holy Spirit does with us when we are faithful and courageous. 
Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you for this story. I am so thankful to get to, to spend some time with it and, and to try to see it in the bigger picture. I'm asking that you would fill me with boldness. I, you and I have talked about this a lot. I've been through everything recently, and, and my faith is there, but it wavers. And I ask that you would continue to build me with strength a willingness and a courage to proclaim your goodness. And Father, for us, for this church, for Nina and for Addison, as they begin to move into the world, God, that the faith that we have and the faith that we proclaim would be so, so real, would be so tangible in our lives, that it would dictate every decision and every interaction like it did for Peter and John. And God, that in that, you would help us to be bold to be courageous in the sharing of the gospel. And God, in doing that, change the world through us. Change this town through us. Grow your kingdom here because you have found a group of faithful followers. God, help us to learn from this. Help us to grow in it. I ask your blessings on us as we pursue this type of bold faith in living. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. We're going to finish with our uh, time of benediction. Um, are y'all doing something afterwards, David? Should I save the benediction or you want me to do it now? No, go ahead. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do, do uh, close our time of worship with benediction. Then I know that there's some, some business to follow after that. Um, so if you get your worship guide, look with me. It's Romans 15. Stand with me. Uh, what we'll do is we will read this, this together, and this will serve as our benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen.